1 John 5, Romans 10, Ephesians chapter 3. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, again I do thank you for the many blessings of this day. Lord, I thank you for this time with your word. And Lord, your word truly is precious. Your word is what will change people's hearts. It is your word that builds our faith, and it is your word that brings us ever closer to Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us now, that he would work on our hearts and our minds and help us to understand your word, building our faith upon your word, and helping us to then take these things and use them in our lives, not just today, but throughout all this coming week. Lord, you have truly blessed us by giving us your word written down like this, that we can read it and reread it and know that every last jot and tittle is true, to know that you have preserved it throughout the ages. And God, I thank you for that. And Lord, despite all that can happen, nobody can destroy your word. Your word will always stand strong. And I pray that daily we would be reading it and following it and growing in our love for you through it. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so 1 John chapter 5, we're going to be down at verse 11. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So eternal life is found in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. If anyone wants eternal life, then they will need to believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, a person will still have eternal life, but they will be eternally apart from Jesus Christ. Life, true life, is in God's Son. So it becomes as simple as this. If a person does not have Jesus Christ, they do not have life. If a person has Jesus Christ, they have life. Doesn't matter the denomination, it does not matter the religion. It does not matter the theology. It does not matter the lifestyle choices. It does not matter about geography and where someone is. It does not matter the social status of a person. It does not matter the anything else. If they do not have Jesus Christ as their Savior, then they do not have eternal life in heaven one day. They will have eternal life, but in the lake of fire. And it is the truth. And to be honest, once you have Jesus Christ, you have the Jesus Christ of the Bible, then the other stuff falls into line. But you got to start with the foundation. You don't build a house by building the second story and then building the first story. You build the house by building the foundation first. Jesus Christ must be that foundation. Without him, you don't have eternal life. And it, it's true. It may sound harsh. It may sound cruel. But it is the truth, plain and simple. Without Christ, 
you're condemned to hell. It's that simple. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Nobody else can save you from everlasting destruction and condemnation. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He sacrificed his life on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and those that have accumulated. He was buried in the sepulcher, and on the third day, Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and he will be returning soon. And people must believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they reject Jesus Christ, they do not have Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, they do not and will not have life. Verses 11 and 12 cannot be explained much simpler than that. And what you see today is people are so focused. They're focused on race. They're focused on divisions. If you're not part of my tribe, then I don't want anything to do with you. And people, people fail to see that there are only two divisions in this world. There's only two, born again and not. Saved and unsaved, only two. Those that believe on Jesus Christ as their Savior and those that do not believe on Jesus Christ, only two divisions that matter. Verses 11 and 12 make it quite clear that there is no such thing as a universal salvation. The Lord God of heaven is holy and he is righteous, and God is not going to act in a manner that is contrary to himself. Everyone is not going to heaven, because, sadly, many will reject and deny Jesus Christ. Those that have the Son should be and must be telling those that do not have the Son that they need Jesus Christ. And that is what God has called each of you to do. Keep your finger here in John, 1 John, and go over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and go down to verse 9. Romans 9, 10. Or I'm sorry, 10, 9. 10, 9. <clears throat> that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. To have the Son is to call upon him. Go on to verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To have the Son is to come to him. To have the Son is to be able to come to Jesus Christ and to believe on him, to repent of your sins and believe on his gospel, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's the same Lord over all. Now, the Bible does make a distinction with Jew and Greek or Jew and Gentile, but both of them, if they don't have Jesus Christ, are again apart from God. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 tells us, Come unto me, this is Jesus Christ speaking, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're to come to Jesus Christ. We're to come to him humbly, looking for him for that salvation, for that help that we need each day. Right, we're done in Romans. Go back over to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So God has provided a record for you to believe, and that's the scriptures. You know, he's, he's, it's just like, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, history of the this congregation and everything, and the church building and everything, and, and you know, not finding a lot of different reports on the history overall. And, and that's the type of record that we're talking about. God has provided a record, and that's the scriptures. Your record is right here. And the Bible is God's testimony of his son, Jesus Christ. It is his written witness of what and who is true, Jesus Christ. And we discussed this some a couple weeks ago with the verses earlier in chapter 5, <clears throat> talking about the different witnesses and how to have anything be proven to be true, you had to have more than just one witness. And God provides that witness. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he writ wrote it down as a written record of all of that. So if you deny Jesus Christ, then you are calling God a liar. Look at verse 10 here. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. And the scriptures have been written unto you so that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. In other words, you believe what is written in this book and you have salvation through the name of Son of God. And, 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 and you may know that you have eternal life. I can't imagine standing before God and saying, one day and saying, oh, I think you were a liar. You know, but that's what people are doing on this earth today. They deny Jesus Christ, or they say there's a universal salvation or anything that goes contrary to the scriptures, and they're calling God a liar. When you believe what is written in the scriptures, then you will also know that you will have eternal life. You are then telling and then showing others that you know that God is not a liar, and you are testifying that you know that you have eternal life. Do you trust Jesus Christ? Do you trust what he has said in his word? Really, how comforting it is to know that you have eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven one day. To have that assurance of the gift of God that is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no better gift, and it is a gift. There is nothing you can do to earn it, to get, or to keep it. Jesus Christ is the one that died on the cross, not you. And Jesus Christ is the one that washed you in his own blood, not you. And Jesus Christ is the one that resurrected from the dead, not you. You know, and so you think about all the different denominations, all the different religions that are out there, and so many, and well, really all but one, teach that you've got to do something. You've got to work for something. You've got to keep something. And even then, they're not guaranteed 
salvation. You're not guaranteed heaven. How scary that must be. Really, in a lot of ways, because you, you, you're pretty sure you'll get to heaven, but you may have to spend a few hundred years in purgatory to burn it off. What a lie. How awful. You know, it, what is it? I've, I've, I won't even get into that. But Jesus Christ did it. It's done. I don't have to do the five pillars of the faith or keep the seven sacraments or, or you know, Jesus Christ, I do my best and Jesus Christ does the rest. That's awful thinking. Because how often do I really do my best? If you want to really be honest, in which case I'm already in trouble if it's relying upon me to get me to heaven. And it can't. It has to rely on Jesus Christ and him alone, not me. Verse 13 here in 1 John chapter 5 assures you that you have eternal life through Jesus Christ, that you have eternal security through Jesus Christ. And what you will find is that you will better understand what Jesus Christ has done for you through his death burial and resurrection the closer you grow to god and the stronger your faith becomes in all of this and there are those that will say oh but there is no such thing as once saved always saved or there is no eternal security that you can lose your salvation scriptures don't show that if i'm in my father's hand no man can pluck me out of it and that doesn't mean that i can then wiggle my way out of it But there are those that have made professions of faith but didn't actually believe. They may have been one of us but not of us, is how John put it earlier. In other words, they, they may have made the profession but they didn't truly believe. And I've given you examples in the past of people that I've talked to and, you know, and, and going and, and going with other people, not less, you know, and, and, and the person that I was with, you know, walking them through the sinner's prayer, but we never see them in church again. They may have been of us, but they weren't one of us. They didn't believe, you know? I mean, you know, back when we were living in Maslin, and there was a, a classmate of our oldest daughter's. And, and she, she had a personal situation and, and all of a sudden wanted to know more about Jesus Christ. And we, we walked her through the gospel and she made a profession of faith. And we were like, oh, how wonderful this is. And we were going and driving all the way out to Canton to pick her up and drive her to church and, and bring her with us. And, and, and we spent time with her and got it scheduled so that she could get baptized. And she got baptized before the church. And then the very next week, she stopped coming. She felt she had that assurance at that point, got what she wanted, felt that the baptism was going to take care of her. Never saw her again to come to church. I mean, we saw her a couple of times as we tried to encourage her to come back, but she never did. And she's living, as far as I know, she's still living a wicked, wicked lifestyle. And she may be still holding, thinking in her head, I, I, but I made that profession, I got baptized, I'm all set. It's awful. It's awful. So there is such a thing as eternal security. And, and we can know that we have it. That's what verse 13 tells us. But it, and, and eternal security is not a license to sin. It's not a get out of hell free card. But there are those that confuse it to be in that. But that's not what it's talking about. Right, look at verse 14. 
And this is the confidence. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. You know, you think about it. If you can't have confidence in your salvation, then how can you have confidence in Jesus Christ and anything else? Having confidence in your salvation leads to confidence in your faith. Not overconfidence. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Not overconfidence, not pride, but a quiet confidence in your walk with Jesus Christ. And you will have the boldness to go to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now understand, when I'm saying boldness, people think of boldness today as somebody strutting and swaggering. That's not the boldness that is being talked about here. Instead, it's the boldness that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 3. So go over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and go to verse 8. Ephesians 3, verse 8. I'm reading essentially the whole sentence because it gives you more of the context here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. Paul writes, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So when I first was writing this out, I just wanted to do verse 12, but I'm realizing, no, I can't do just verse 12. You've got to have the whole sentence and you, so that you get better of the context in it. And so in other words, what Paul is saying here is that you do not approach the king of kings with a strut and a swagger, nor do you go before him timidly and afraid to speak. Be willing and be able to approach the Lord God of heaven boldly and humbly, willing to bring your petitions and concerns and praises to him to hear. The Lord has shown you grace, even though you were once a child of wrath and disobedience. And that is the message that we then share with the lost. That's what he's talking about here. You know, in verse 8 there, you know, we're to, that I should preach unto the, among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. We have a wonderful message to share. And those that don't know Jesus Christ don't know the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. And that means that those riches are inexhaustible. If you were to go and somehow get a hold of Bill Gates's credit card, at some point you will reach the limit on spending his credit card. It will take probably a very long, long time to do so, but eventually there will be a limit and, and you'll put the card in the, the machine and it'll come back denied insufficient funds. With God, they are in, un, as it says there, unsearchable riches of Christ. So you can't even have an index and, and look through that index and have it be a complete index of all the riches. You cannot search and know the full depth, height, length, width of his riches. They are inexhaustible forever, eternally. That's amazing. And that just shows how big God is. And, and, and it's so hard to grasp how big he is. Because his riches are infinite. And they are not only material riches. 
which is far better because they are spiritual riches, Amen. which is so much better. Amen. Because God has blessed us materially, but the spiritual riches are so much better. And they'll last. They won't wear out. You have a wonderful message to share with this world and a wonderful message to remind yourself of. And having confidence in Jesus Christ is all the difference in your life. Because you will, you will understand that you can trust Jesus Christ. You have confidence that he will hear you when you call out to him in prayer and that he does care for you and that he doesn't say, oh, him again calling me? He doesn't do that. He wants you to call on him minute by minute, moment by moment, day by day. He wants you to call out to him. And having that confidence is the beginning of effectual prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much is what James wrote. So we do not, do not want to be timid. We do not want to be double-minded when you're praying to the Lord God. Instead, have confidence in him. Not overconfidence, but have confidence in him. Because prayer is for the child of God. Those that are born again, their prayers are heard by God. Prayer is what God has reserved for those that are his own. Those that are without Jesus Christ do not have this privilege of prayer. He will hear those that pray for salvation, but he does not necessarily heed the prayers of those that do not know him. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. How do you get to meet the President of the United States? In general, you have to be invited to meet him. You cannot just walk up to the White House, knock on the front door, and announce that you want to meet with the President. Another way you get to meet with the President is if you've done something special, like win a championship or fix a problem. But even then, when you meet with the president, you only meet with him for a moment, and he moves on to the next person, and he'll never remember you. You have just met one of the most powerful men in the world, and honestly, you meant very little to him. God is not like that. He wants to hear from his own. He wants you to pray to him. And the Lord will remember your prayer. He will remember all of it and will not need it repeated over and over and over. You are going to the Lord in prayer. You are praying to the most powerful Lord of all the one that is greater than any others. And he listens to you. He listens. He pays attention. What a wonderful God we serve. Go back over to, uh, to 1 John. You look at uh, the second phrase there in verse 14. 1 John 5, 14. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So in other words, your prayer must be in alignment with God's will. Think of it this way. <laughs> you get four new tires on your car, and the mechanic suggests you get the four wheels aligned. Now why? Why does he suggest that? A wheel alignment gets all four wheels pointed in the correct and same direction. Because think about it. What would happen if your front wheels both pointed to the left and your rear wheels pointed to the right? 
your car would drive rough, very rough, and the tires would wear out very unevenly. I remember working for a tire place a long time ago, and, and you could tell when a car was out of alignment because one shoulder on the tire, the edge, would be completely clean, and you'd have a full set of tread on the other shoulder. Classic symptom of a car being out of alignment. Or else you would find where the, the tread would be cupped, would have a, a, a divot every so often, scalloped, if you will. Yeah, it was out of alignment. And it would not be a comfortable drive. Likewise, if you're praying outside of God's will, if you're not in alignment with God's will, he's not going to answer a prayer that is out of his will. You pray in alignment with his will. You don't pray, dear Lord, let me win the lottery. Dear Lord, let Publishers Clearinghouse show up on my doorstep with that big paper check. That's outside of God's will. But I'll give most of it to the church. It's outside of God's will. It's outside of God's will. You will not pray in a manner that is contrary to what the Bible says. Instead, pray looking to emulate God's character. So when you pray, pray for love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. When you pray, praying according to God's will, that begins with praying the things that God has specifically told us to pray for, such as our daily bread. God has told us to pray for forgiveness. Pray for deliverance from evil. Pray for mercy. Pray for grace to help in the time of need. Pray for strength in the soul. Pray for laborers of God's harvest. Pray that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. Pray for spiritual wisdom. Pray to walk worthy of God's will. Pray for spiritual fruit. Pray to know God. And pray that God's word will have free course and be glorified. And pray for kings and authorities that we might lead again a quiet and peaceable life. <coughs> Excuse me. And pray, confessing your sins, most of all. We must not pray demanding things of God. You cannot dictate to God. Instead, surrender to the Lord's will. Humble yourself before him. Pray that it is his will be done and not your own. And pray, trusting that God will answer your prayer and be ready to accept his answer, even if it is not the answer you hoped for. Verse 16, if any, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. This is intercessory prayer that John is writing about here. Prayer that is watching over others and going to the Lord in prayer, interceding for them. And it is truly a part of loving one another. Philippians 2.4 tells us, Look not every man on his own doings, but every man also on the things of others. We're to be praying for others. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. 
Do not just pray for lost people and for situations, but we need to be praying for each other, praying for our fellow believers. And if there is a believer that is overcome in sin, all the more reason to pray for them. That's not being judgmental. It is being loving. Galatians 6.1 tells us, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help, to guide, to convict, to whatever is necessary for your fellow believers. So we have to remember, sin in the life of the believer hinders the fellowship that he or she has with the Lord. It does not cause them to lose their salvation, but the fellowship with God is not there as it should be. Sin that continues and is unrepented of will drag a believer further from the Lord, and that is why you must pray for them that they would repent and see the damage that their sin has done. And it goes on and it says there, there is a sin unto death. All unrighteousness is sin. If a person continues in sin and does not repent of that sin, they, and they have turned from God's chastisement of that sin, it will lead to death. Paul talks about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he was talking about the Lord's Supper and how sadly at the Corinthian church, they had turned it into a love feast. In other words, you know, and, and people were, everybody was bringing food and not everybody was willing to share with others. And there were others that were just completely approaching it with the wrong way. And, it, and Paul goes on to write, and some sleep, and some sleep. Whenever a believer is recorded about dying in the Bible, it says they go to sleep. An unbeliever, it just says they died. <clears throat> and so Paul is talking about those that were believers, they were caught up in that sin, whatever the sin was exactly, and God took them, called them home early because of their sin. That's the sin unto death. You think of it this way, it is like a man that needs an oxygen tank to put in order to breathe, but he still insists on smoking. At some point, that oxygen and that cigarette are not going to agree. Continuous, unrepentant sin will lead to death. So we need to pray. Pray that the sinner will repent and turn to the Lord again. Verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, and he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that the wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. I just want to touch quickly on what it's saying there in verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Now, we, we covered this a few weeks ago as well, because John made a similar statement earlier, either in chapter 4 or 5. <clears throat> I am a child of God. I do sin. Now, if we look at verse 18 and we isolated it to that only, you could read it and think, oh, if I've sinned, I'm no longer a child of God. Problem is, then you've got to ignore what John wrote about in chapter 1. In John chapter 1, in fact, let's go there. I'm only going over this again because I want you to make sure you want make sure you understand what he's saying here in five and what he's saying here in one. You go to verse eight, chapter verse first John, one eye John, 
chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So it would almost seem there must be a contradiction between the two, but there's no contradiction here. Let me keep going here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So, how do we reconcile the two with all of this? We have to, first of all, remember that John is writing to believers here. He's not writing to the lost person. It's a different situation when it's dealing with a lost person. But when it's saying here, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, that he that is begotten of God is, keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. What we have to remember, and, and, and this is where the new birth is, and we covered that two or three weeks ago. This is where the new birth comes in. We're still in these fleshly bodies. We're in these fleshly tabernacles. Sadly, we're going to sin, and that's what John's talking about in 1 John chapter 1. However, <coughs> what it also is talking about here is... <coughs> We're still in fleshly bodies, but we had a spiritual birth. When we got born, when we were born again, we had the spiritual birth, and that's what we're talking about. Because it says, "We know that whosoever is born of God." In other words, as a child of God, my sins have been paid for, have been taken care of. Now, if it said here instead, "We know that whosoever or." Let's put me in there. I know that whosoever, and, all right, I'm not making that come out right, but let's say instead of saying born of God, it said Scott was born of Judy, of my mother's name. Um, that's a different thing. That's my physical birth. It's my physical birth. I still sin, and I will sadly continue to sin. But spiritual, it's a different thing. I am under the blood of Jesus Christ. When I die and go to heaven, I don't have to worry about God then saying, oh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to spend a hundred years in purgatory burning off the rest of your sins. Jesus Christ paid it all. And so even if my last thought as I die was a sinful thought, it's still covered under the blood. It's still been washed away eternally but I still have the temporal sins that I deal with here on earth and there are consequences for the sins I do here on earth there will be consequences if I choose to become an alcoholic and drink and drink and drink and drink I'm going to have the consequences of my liver dying sooner than the rest of me that's the consequences of that sin of doing that <clears throat> And so that's the point here in verse 18. It doesn't mean that once we're born again, we no longer sin. That was something that came out back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Salvation Army, when it first started, taught holiness. They called it the holiness movement. And so that, and it, was, it ultimately became a convoluted mess because what they would teach is, I still sin, but it wasn't me that sinned, it was my old man, so there'll be no consequences of it. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If I still sin here on earth, there is a consequence for my sin here on earth. But eternally, Jesus Christ has paid for it. But I still have to deal with the consequences here. And so the holiness movement, and you can read, there's a wonderful book by H.A. Uh, Ironside about it and how he struggled with that and finally realized it was a lie. You know, these people were teaching something that just didn't align with the Bible. If it doesn't align with the Bible, it's a lie. They, it doesn't matter how sincere they believed it. It's still a lie. And really, ultimately, what it becomes is, as John closes here with, oh, i got to wrap this up, John, verse 21, little children, little children keep yourselves from idols. 
Because really, anything that teaches against what the Bible says, it's ultimately idolatry. It's lifting up a false god and following that rather than following the one true God, Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to do and follow each day. And, and Jesus Christ is the truth. We have eternal life through him and him alone. And that's what we need to then tell others about. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, I thank you for this time with your word. And I thank you, Lord, that your word is there for us, that it helps us, that it grows us, and that it, it changes us and brings us ever closer to Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would just daily help us to grow and understand your word. And even though there may be parts that are difficult to understand, as Peter wrote, or hard to understand, as Peter wrote, I, Lord, I thank you that your Holy Spirit can help us with the understanding. <laughs> And God, I pray, pray that he would help us. And Lord, I pray as we go through this week, we would stay close by your side, that we would be vessels that are fit for your use. And we would remember that we are your ministers and your ambassadors to this world. And Lord, we have a message of hope that nobody else out there has. And it's a hope that we can know and that they can know. And I pray that you would help us to do just that. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name.